stuck in the fire drill or whatever was going on down in the other part of the spine. Um, so today we're going to talk about exokernels. So um, show of hands, how many people tried to read the paper? Awesome. Okay. How many people liked the paper? Oh, wow. Okay. That's <laughs> a small crowd. Um, I like this paper a lot. I was sort of happily writing slides today about it. I think this is a really cool system, and I hope I can convince the people that didn't have their hands up that this is, this is a really neat paper. And then I think this, um, so when I started teaching this course, this paper and its division of operating system responsibilities like really influenced my thinking, and you guys probably noticed that because that's how I break down what the operating system is responsible for. But I think if you understand multi, if you understand exokernels, you'll go a long way to understanding the monolithic kernels that we've been studying. And I think a paper like this is reading it and making sure you understand it is a great way to prepare for our exam and other things, because this paper highlights a lot of things we've been talking about. OK. Um, so still under three weeks, coming up on um, exactly two weeks on Friday. It's hard to believe. The semester is really flying by. So um, yeah, so, so three weeks, just to put this in context, when I was at Harvard, we would give students there three weeks to do assignment three. For the first couple of years that we, I, I was involved in this class, we gave people two weeks, and they didn't consider that to be enough time. So, you know, you're coming up on two weeks. Hopefully, you have enough time to finish it. Um, the current max score is 77. I checked this a few hours ago, so who knows? Maybe it's moved. You guys are getting closer. Um, I'm a bit surprised, though, because, you know, you guys are the class that ate assignment two, right? I mean, you guys just really wrecked that assignment. Um, and so I'm hoping that we see some, you know, nice scores over the next couple weeks. Don't give up on assignment three. It's actually a lot more interesting. Um, when I was, when we taught this class at Harvard, David had this maxim, which is he said, every class only does well on either assignment two or assignment three. Um, he said he had noticed that over multiple years. So I'm hoping that that doesn't hold true because I want you guys to do well on assignment three. Okay. So let's talk exokernels. So first of all, what kind of paper is this? From our taxonomy from a few times ago, uh, what type of paper is this? I know you guys have only read one or two, but how would you categorize it? Yeah. OK, so this was, a, this was originally a conference paper. Right, so where did this appear? This originally appeared in SOSP, the Symposium on Operating System Principles, which is the top conference in computer systems. Um, so it's a, the, I think the version you guys read might have actually uh, eventually ended up in a journal, might have had some extra material. But this is a, was originally presented at SOSP in 1995, so 20 years ago. Um, but what, in terms of, uh, you know, is this a data analysis paper? Is this a problem paper? What kind of paper is this? Yeah. Yeah, I would describe this as a big idea paper. Uh, there's, a, there's a really important and fundamental observation about how operating systems are built and organized that was introduced in this paper. And it's also kind of a wrong way paper. It's also trying to make an argument that the way that we've been building kernels and operating systems is incorrect. And it tries to point out some of the consequences of this mistake. Okay? So what's the key contribution? How would you describe the key contribution of this paper? It's a big idea. What's the big idea here? Yeah. Yeah, that's not a bad way of putting it, right? Um, the, the argument, the big idea the paper makes is that there are these two things that the operating system is responsible for. Multiplexing and physical resources and implementing useful abstractions. And these two things are separable. And in fact, we can build a, what we, you would traditionally think of an oper as an operating system, the types of things we've talked about all semester. We can divide them cleanly into a part of the system that only implements, now they, they use the term protection rather than mechanisms, but it's pretty close. And another part of the system that does management, and that's sort of uh, akin to policy. So this is the big idea of this paper. Um, yeah, they, they refer, they also, uh, you can also talk about this as multiplexing resources and providing abstractions. 
but they also use the terms protection for multiplexing resources and management for managing those resources and organizing them in ways that provide useful abstractions. And the, so what's the point of doing this? Why would I want to implement a system this way? Their argument is that there are problems caused by the commingling or the intermingling of these two roles in traditional operating system designs that we can address by separating them clean. And so when you get to the evaluation, you'll notice that they evaluate two parts of the system. They evaluate an actual exokernel, which is the small, lower level piece, and they evaluate a library operating system called Exos that's built on top of the lower level piece. What does this sound, based on Monday's lecture, what does this sound a little bit like? Yeah, this might remind you a little bit of microkernels. What's the difference? To some degree, we're, in both cases, we're separating out, we're taking the big monolithic kernel and we're producing a division and what's left over is a small piece that does something and one or more other pieces that do other things. What's the difference, you know, if I ask, for example, on an exam, what's the difference between um, the microkernel design philosophy for kernels and the exokernel philosophy? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so the, the, to some degree, microkernels are trying to reduce the kernel down to as small as possible. But remember the types of things that the microkernels were doing. What were some of the things that microkernels provided? What was one thing that was really important on microkernels? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, IPC. The exokernel people argue IPC is an abstraction. IPC should not be provided by the kernel. So when you look at the, the, the microkernels, what's in a microkernel and what's in an exokernel, the organizing principle is totally different. So in an exokernel, the idea is only protection should be done inside the exokernel itself. Everything else, all the management things are done outside of it. And in fact, one of the arguments they make in the paper is that IPC is the type of abstraction that suffers because it, it current, currently kernels force apps to use the interfaces that they provide for IPC when there's a lot of more flexible or better ways of building IPC primitives that would be possible if you enable more flexibility. Um, so here's the, you know, the quote from the paper, the separation of resource protection for management allows application, application specific customization of traditional operating system abstractions by extending, specializing, or even replacing libraries, because now I'm implementing those abstractions in a library. This, this paper and this idea sort of gave birth to this idea of what are called library operating systems, and there's still people working on those today. There's still, this is still sort of an idea that's continued to, that people have continued to think about. How do I implement most of what we would consider to be the OS interface in a library, an unprivileged library, and move as much as possible into this other, uh, other piece? Okay, so what's the key problem that this paper is solving then? Sort of related to the contribution? Yeah. The way OS is implemented or abstraction favors certain Yeah, so, so it's really, it's a great way of saying it. It's, it's, it's the inflexibility OS interface. Their argument is the OS provides this interface, and that's what you guys have come to recognize as the operating system interface. Open, close, read, write, file system related stuff, process abstractions, threads. A lot of these involve abstractions, and the problem is that there's this one sort of one size fits all, take it or leave it interface that every application has to use. And because that interface combines abstractions with protection, what ends up happening is apps are forced to use the abstractions that the kernel provides. We'll come up, we'll, we'll talk about some examples of this later. So operating systems define the interface between applications and physical resources. Unfortunately, this interface can significantly limit the performance and implementation freedom of applications. And this was at a time, if you look at some of the other papers that they were citing, 
when a lot of people were starting to focus on the operating system as a bottleneck, an operating system as something that can slow down applications. Particularly, they're going to argue through management and policy decisions that the operating system gets involved in that it should not be making. Now, there was a lot of work around this time on various ways of producing more flexible, extensible operating systems. But this is, I think, in many ways, the most conceptually clean and principled approach to this problem, in my opinion. OK. So according to the paper, what is the role of the operating system? The lowest level piece, what should it do? And what should it only do? The operating system, you know, they, they, they point out that the operating system has these two roles that are unfortunately intertwined in ways that end up not helping out applications. What should the OS do? Yeah. So, so if, if the two roles are management and protection, the OS should do just protection. If the two roles are multiplexing and abstractions, the OS should just do multiplexing. There's not a perfect fit here, but if the two roles were policy and mechanism, the OS is just providing mechanisms that allow multiple applications to safely use the same parts of the machine together while providing as few constraints as possible into how those are actually used. So, so in this architecture, a minimal kernel, which we call an exakernel, securely multiplexes available hardware resources Library operating systems working above the exokernel interface implement higher level abstractions. We'll come back to talking about this, but you guys should start thinking about how these two concepts have been sort of inter interchanged, right? So let's go through some examples. So for the, in the memory management system, our, is preventing processes from accessing memory that they don't have, ac that they shouldn't be able to use, is that protection or management? Protection. Right? This simply means I've given you some memory and I want to make sure that you only use your memory. There's no abstraction involved here. I have to multiplex memory. This is one of the things that's involved in doing. What about choosing what page to swap out in order to create more memory when the system is under memory pressure? So this is management, right? Now this is now a policy decision that the operating system is making without involving the application. So here's a case where the operating system's roles have started to get more muddied, right? This is the type of thing that the exokernel people would say the operating system should not be doing. It's the type of choice the operating system should not be making. What about two gigabyte contiguous address spaces? This is a management decision. There's no reason, you know, the address, we talked about why the address space abstraction is nice. And there's a lot of things that are nice about it. But it doesn't have to be implemented by the operating system. It's possible that other applications might want to organize their memory in other ways. And actually, as part of the evaluation, they look at a couple of different ways that you can reorganize memory address spaces if you're given this flexibility by an exocurve. How about controlling how much memory is allocated to each process? So this is, this is a protection decision to some degree, right? You might also argue that it's management, but the exokernel architecture doesn't necessarily uh, provide a good way to do this. Um, what about starting the process heap at a particular location? It's a management decision, right? Who, who cares? Why is the kernel telling me where to put my heap? Because I know if only I could put my heap in another location, I would get better performance. So, so these are the types of trade-offs that the, the system is trying to explore, right? And as we pointed out, this sounds a little bit like policy versus mechanism. It's not a perfect fit, but it's not a bad way to think about it. Okay, so the, the paper does a really nice job of attacking and pointing out fundamental flaws with traditional operating system designs. And in the introduction, they say, hard-coding the implementations of these abstractions is inappropriate for three main reasons. So the first reason, it denies applications the advantage of domain-specific optimizations. 
but we'll talk about all these in more detail. The second one is it discourages changes to the implementations of existing abstractions. The third is it re restricts the flexibility of application builders. Since if you want to implement a new kind of abstraction, you have to try to build it on the one that's already there because you're stuck with the one that's there. There's no way to change the one that's there. And so if you're trying to build something new, you have to kind of try to make do with these uh, management decisions that the operating system is making on your behalf and hope that they don't get in the way of whatever it is that you're trying to do. Um, later in the motivation, they provide a different set of reasons. Just, you know, when you, when you try to motivate systems, there's one hard and fast rule, which is you always need three reasons, right? Four is too many, two is not enough, three is the perfect number, right? As long as you have three reasons, you're, you're good. People will, at that point, people will believe you. Um, okay, so they, they point out in the, in the motivation to fix abstractions, hurt application performance, they hide useful information from applications, and they also limit application functionality. So let's talk about each one of these in more detail. So hurting performance. So how does the intermingling of management and protection hurt performance? And this is really, so, so these, these two sets, this set and this set, are, are somewhat related to each other. So I've tried to map them onto each other. Uh, hurting performance is clearly kind of equivalent to limiting the opportunity for domain-specific optimizations. So, so here's an example from the paper. Relational databases and garbage collectors sometimes have very predictable data access patterns, and their performance suffers when a general purpose page replacement strategy, such as LRU, is imposed by the operating system. So here's a case where if you asked the app, if you asked my garbage collection library, if you asked the database system, what page should I remove? It has a pretty good idea of a good page for you to prune. But what does the operating system do instead? It makes these guesses. It tries to choose the right page without consulting with the application, and that can lead to poor performance. So in contrast, the monolithic algorithm, you know, operating system is gonna say, here's some memory. When I need it back, I'm gonna take it away from you without telling you. And I'm not gonna tell you which pages I took. You can just find that out later. It's a little surprise, right? When you go to use a page, oh wow, I thought that page was in memory. Suddenly there's a huge stall. So imagine as an application perform uh, writer, particularly when you're trying to write some sort of high performance application, how disconcerting that is, right? You're motoring along, or walking through some big array in memory, trying to meet some sort of latency requirement, and suddenly one of those pages takes a thousand times longer to access than the others. So that's just really not great. When we get to virtualization, one of the things we'll talk about is the fact as a result of this, one of the reasons why virtualization became popular is that there, it got to a, the point where certain companies that sold high performance database software, for example, would not guarantee its performance unless you ran it all by itself on the system. As soon as you installed a web server next to your database server, you voided the warranty. No more promises. And the reason is because the operating system is trying to move resources between these two applications, and that can really hurt performance when the applications don't understand what's going on. Now, of course, for people who bought these systems, it's very frustrating because suddenly I need 10 servers, one for my web server, one for my database server, you know, one for the file server, whatever, right? And, and that's one of the reasons why virtualization took off in the first place. In contrast, what is the exokernel going to do here to, to address this problem? What does the exokernel have to do to address this problem? Yeah. I yeah, so when the OS needs to reclaim memory, clearly the application has to be involved. So there has to be, and, and we'll come back to this when we talk about the design of the system, right? Because this, is, this directly feeds into the design of one of the features that exokernels have to provide. Okay, so what about hiding information? And this is sort of restricted, related to restricting flexibility. It's not a perfect match, but. So 
one of the things that current systems don't do is make these low-level events visible to applications. So applications don't see exceptions caused by devices. They don't see uh, low-level timer interrupts. They don't see, they're not able to do raw device I.O. And this uh, makes it difficult for applications to implement their own resource management abstractions. So for example, database systems that are implemented on top of file systems. And this, this, was a, this was a complaint that had a lot of resonance because database systems are one of, in many cases, one of the more performance critical, ap critical applications that people were trying to run on modern operating systems at this time. So there's this whole community of people that does work on databases, and there's this whole community of people that does work on operating systems, and the database people were shrieking because the operating, they, they said, you know, we can't make any, it's, it's so hard for us to understand how the system works and how it performs because we have this stupid file system in the way. So here's an example. Database system may want to arrange certain chunks of its data on the disk so that they can be independently accessed. Or, for example, I might want to put all the data, so what's one sort of, given what you know about file systems, what's one file system disk-related optimization that a database system might want to utilize? Remember all those fun things that the file systems were trying to do to improve disk performance? What's an example? What's that? Yeah, the file, that's, that's sort of easy to do, right? That's just where I allocate blocks. But locality, right? I mean, the database may want to say, I know that all of these pages of my data should go on the same track, in the same cylinder group, whatever. There is no way to get a file system to do this. You just put it in a file, and the file system now gets to make choices about where that data ends up. And this becomes a performance problem. So the monolithic OS, the file system that it runs says, here's a file. It's got this, it's this great abstraction that has these great properties that can grow and shrink and has a nice name or whatever. The only problem is you have no idea where those disk blocks are. You have no control over where they're allocated um, and where they go. So what does the exokernel OS have to do here? This, this hints at another one of the design requirements for the exokernel system. In order to address this problem, what does the exokernel actually have to allow library operating systems or applications to do? Right. Yeah, I actually have to allow it to address the disk. And this is really interesting because this requires that the exokernel expose low level names to applications. I can't just give you this path string that's this nice sequence of characters. I actually need to allow you to directly, this is 1995, right? So people still cared about spinning disks. I need to allow you to directly address the disk using block IDs, right? File systems were trying to hide those from the applications. This paper is making the argument we don't want to do that anymore. Um, now it turned out that Designing exokernel file systems, you may have read this paper and, and thought, huh, where is the file system? Turned out that that was hard. And there's a whole separate paper that discusses the details of this in depth. This, was my, this is my favorite quote from it. Um, Exen is our fourth design. So they built this system. It didn't work very well. Apparently there were three other designs that clearly were insufficient. And let's keep in mind, these guys are are pretty serious hackers. These are guys that are sort of famous now for building systems. If they had to build it four times, it meant it was, it was hard. Um, okay, so, but that's a cool paper actually if you want to learn a lot about how to get this to work for file systems. And as you can imagine, file systems are potentially more complicated because as we know, the file system is actually this big data structure that has to sit on disk and there was a lot of challenges in being able to build file systems on top of the exokernels that aren't really discussed in this paper. But if you want to find out more, the link's on the website. Okay, so the third problem, limiting functionality. So here they make, I think, a little bit of a weaker argument where they say, 
look, there's been all this research on new operating system features. They name a couple in the paper. Why don't we see them in real production systems? And their argument is this is being held back by the fact that because the policy and mechanism, because the management and protection is all intermingled, you can't change one without changing the other. So in, in a traditional operating system, how would I change something like the page replacement policy? What would I have to do? Let's say with a tradi traditional monolithic OS, I want to change the page replacement policy. What do I need to do? Yeah. I have to reinstall the entire kernel. And it's a great point. Every application is affected by my new experimental page replacement policy. Not necessarily what everybody wants. What can I do on an exokernel system? Just roll it out as a library. Remember, these abstractions and these management decisions are now being made by unprivileged libraries, and so they're way easier to distribute. In fact, every application can make its own decisions about this. So um, just, just to connect this to the future, in fact, just a few years ago, you may have seen some of the videos that I've posted uh, from James Micken, funniest and one of the smartest people in computer systems. So he actually built, he took this same principle and applied it to the browser, roughly 20 years later. So he had a paper a couple years ago, maybe we'll look at it later if we have time, although there's a lot of overlap with this paper where he made the same arguments, very similar arguments about modern browsers. And his solution is actually very similar. Every page now can come along with its own HTML rendering engine. So this is, if you guys, how many people have ever built a web page? How many people have ever noticed how different that web page looks on different browsers, potentially? Yeah, you hate that, right? And that's because every browser is sort of its own private universe. So James's argument is every page should be able to essentially implement its own HTML rendering stack, allowing it to make sure that the results are identical, mainly by essentially allowing it to draw the browser window pixel by pixel. Anyway, so very interesting to see these arguments 20 years later in a very different context. Of course, the web browser essentially is the modern operating system, or a modern operating system. Uh, and, and actually, it has many of the same problems that modern operating, old operating systems have that we still haven't figured out how to, how to fix, right? Um, okay. So the comparison here, you know, the monolithic operating system says, here's an address space, and that address space unfortunately has a single protection domain. Sorry. There's, there's no way to have multiple protection domains for the, operate, for the same address basis, which is one of the features that they were talking about. What would the exokernel system say here? The exokernel doesn't implement abstractions. So the address space is like, what? I don't know what an address space is. Look, I just gave you some pages of memory. What you do with them, not my problem. So that gives you an enormous amount of flexibility. Okay, so now that we've talked about the problems, let's sort of connect them with the design principles. So the exokernel design is built to expose four things to apps. Hardware, allocation, names, and revocation. And we'll, I'm going to talk about these in sort of two groups. So the first one is hardware and low-level physical names. Remember, traditional operating systems try to hide this stuff. That was the goal. Make the device, make the system safe by making sure that applications can't directly access hardware. But we've noticed in a couple of the, pro the examples that we use to motivate the system or the examples they used that this now becomes a requirement. So the central tenet of the exokernel architecture is that the kernel should provide secure low-level primitives that allow all hardware resources to be accessed as directly as possible. So, so let's think about how traditional operating systems expose hardware. 
So how does a traditional operating system like the one that you've learned about this semester expose memory? Yeah. Virtual memory, address spaces. So remember what we did? We thought this was a great idea a month ago. We created fake names for memory, these virtual addresses that are meaningless. And we said, woohoo, this is awesome. Now I don't have to allow applications to directly access physical memory. Oh no, now I have to. Because if I don't do this, there's no way to allow library operating systems to manage the resources properly. Um, in contrast, ESO kernels have to expose physical memory directly, and that means names. So remember we said applications never see a physical address? Here the library operating systems have to see physical addresses. So I not only have to allow them to access hardware directly, but I actually have to allow them to name those hardware resources. Of course, those things are really intimately connected. If I don't know what the addresses of actual physical memory are, I can't use it. I can't access it directly. What about the disk? Same example. What, what is the view of the disk that the operating system provides to applications? Yeah, files. Fake names. The file is an abstraction. The name is not, is fake. The name is, is provided by the operating system. In contrast, exokernels have to expose disk blocks and the disk naming. So disk block IDs. This is, this is what exokernels expose to applications and library operating systems. Okay, so now we've done the naming and the hardware. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Yeah. No, so, so that's a great question, right? So the, the MMU is going to remain the same. But what we're going to do is we're going to allow a library operating system to manage virtual to physical address translations. And that, so that's important, right? Because I still might want an abstraction like an address space. So for example, if I want my memory to look like a contiguous 512 megabytes, I need virtual addresses to accomplish that, right? I can't do it with physical memory because I'm going to have pages all over the place. And so the virtual to physical address translation is still important and it's still something that library operating systems use to build abstractions. The difference here is that the abstractions are not provided by the low level operating system. They're implemented on top of it. So for example, I could have one library operating system that provides 512 big address spaces, like four gigabyte address spaces that look contiguous, I could have another uh, library operating system that requires that its binaries be allocated in a, in a small amount of memory as they can fit in. And maybe I, maybe I don't do any sort of dynamic page allocation. I just, or I give you pages that are in, off in some other weird area or something like that. Essentially, everything that we've learned as gospel about memory allocation and disk stuff is just thrown out the window here. I can revisit it. I can rebuild it in a library operating system, but I can also do something totally different. Does that make sense? Yeah. The, the other thing I want to point out is I'm, I'm using the term library operating system, but when you hear that, you can replace it with application. There is no reason that an application has to rely, in, in, that runs on an exokernel system has to rely on a library operating system to do this for it. So for example, I might have a couple of different applications that are running using a Unix-like library operating system and then a database server that manages its own physical resources directly. It does not use a library operating system that says, I know best, I can do this, you give me physical memory, I will make sure it's used properly. That, that's possible. Okay, so let's talk about allocation and revocation. These are the next, and this is essentially, these are the, essentially the things that exokernels have to get to work in order for the rest of this to be safe. They have to allocate and, and, and revocate, I don't know if that's a word, revoke, it's not a word, I know the word. They have to allocate and revoke access to these low level hardware resources. And there's a little bit more subtlety in how this is done in certain places than we're used to based on the operating systems that we've talked about. 
So as they point out, the library operating system should participate in every allocation decision. So when things are allocated, the library operating system has some say in what is allocated. Now, the exokernel still has to make sure that things don't stop on each other, but up to within that bound, I can allow the library operating system to help me make decisions. So here's an example. On a typical operating system, when I give a process a page, let's say it requests more stack, those pages can be anywhere in physical memory. Right? I just find, you guys are writing core maps, I just find an empty page. No problem. All pages are created equal. What does an exokernel have to do? Or what does an exokernel do, need to do in order to allow the library operating system or the application to participate in the allocation decision? Can I just run the same page allocator? Yeah, I need to actually allow operate the, the application, the library OS, to choose physical pages. I might say, hey, here's the physical pages I've got. What do you want? And it might say, oh, I want that one or this one. Now, why would I do this? So it turns out, that memory locality can have an effect on cache performance. Who knew, right? The lovely details of hardware that you try to forget. Um, so, and in some cases, applications may want to pick a specific physical page because it's located closer to other physical pages and might improve performance in the cache. So this is the rationale for doing this. So you thought all pages were created equal and that was a wonderful fiction, but it turns out they're not. And so by allowing the system to allocate these pages, I can do a bit better, okay? Um, what about uh, revocation? So visible revocation allows physical names to be used easily and permits library operating systems to choose which instance of a specific resource to relinquish. So with the CPU, this is one, this is one place where we have a really fun example with the processor. The processor, if you read the paper, is not something they talk about a huge amount. It's not that hard, actually, that's why. Um, but what, what's the difference between how we normally revoke the CPU? So what is normally on a context switch, which is when, which is required for a traditional operating system to revoke the CPU, what do I do? What do I have to do in order to allow the application to be safely restarted? Yeah. Yeah, whatever. That's just a mechanism, right? What do I have to save? Yeah. Yeah, I need to save all the register state. And, and why did, one of the reasons I need to do this, I'm, I'm developing new ticks. I'm pulling my ear a lot today. I'm going to try to stop. Um, it just feels good. Uh, what are the, what the reason, what's the reason I do this, right? I do this because I don't have a way to communicate with the process and say, hey, by the way, what should I save? Because the process doesn't even, the thread doesn't even know potentially that it's being stopped. Exokernels actually allow processes or threads to participate in the revocation process even in the process of revoking the CPU. So I can tell, or, or the, the app can say, oh, by the way, you don't need to save my registers right now. I don't need them. Or I only need this set of registers to be saved and the other ones can be thrown out. So this is potentially kind of cool. What about memory? So typically we're gonna, you know, you guys know how this works. This is swap out. I find a page and I move it to disk. You guys are implementing this. When you find the page, do you say to the process, oh hey process, uh, which page should I remove? No, you just take one. Right? This page looks interesting, let's get rid of it. Right? I mean, that, that works okay. The exokernel has to allow processes to participate in this decision. So when the exokernel needs memory, it has to go to the process, or the library operating system or whatever, and say, you gotta give me a page. I don't care which one, but you gotta make a decision about which one to give me, and do it. So, the way this is done, is through a, a, a mechanism they refer to as secure bindings. So a secure binding 
is a way that they've decoupled authorization and access. And this is important uh, because authorization, which in this system only has to happen when I bind to a resource, can be expensive. Whereas access, we want to be cheap. And this also simplifies the process of performing protection checks. So this probably made no sense. Uh, let me uh, explain it with an example. So for a TLB entry, bind time occurs when the library operating system translates our virtual address to a physical address. This is slow. Now when this happens, what does the, what does the exo kernel have to make have to determine. So essentially, the exo kernel is going to forward page faults to the application. It's going to say, the MMU told me that it couldn't translate this address. What do you want me to do? And the library operating system, if it's implemented like a traditional operating system, is going to use some sort of data structure to look up uh, what physical address that points to. And then it's going to tell the kernel, the exo kernel, load this translation. What does the exo kernel have to check to make sure that this is safe? What do I have to verify? Can I just allow it to modify the TLB directly? Yeah. Yeah, remember, I'm allocating physical memory, but that doesn't mean I allow you to use any physical memory. So the operating system tells the app Here's the faulty virtual address. The app tells the exo kernel, here's the translation I want. The exo kernel has to check to make sure that that physical page is owned by that process. It doesn't care about anything else. It doesn't care, you know, what part of the, that's all it cares about. Does, have I given this process this physical address? So there's a little bit of work I have to do at what they refer to as bind time. Now at access time, once the entry's in the TLB, I'm golden, right? Uh, game over. The TLB will translate it for me, and this is great. So there's a lot of similarity to here, too, to um, controlling memory used by virtual machines. So you guys will probably remember this in a week when we talk a little bit about virtualization. Um, and and they, so they point out, they have a couple of examples. The, the software examples mainly concern how to use the network, which is not something we've talked about in class, and so I didn't really cover in the slides. You guys can look at the paper again. There's some places where software checks are required. So in this case, the access time check is performed by hardware, which is great because it's fast. In other cases, the access time check has to be performed by software. One of the ways that they do this, you guys probably saw this and got all like, we're like downloading code, is the paper cheating? No, so what they mean by this is they mean injecting code into the exo kernel, allowing the exo kernel to load code snippets, little functions that might do useful things from the app or library operating system and run them in the kernel. So here's an example. Code to determine which page to swap out. So when I have to make a swap out decision and I've decided to reclaim memory from this process, I can do one of two things. I can ask the process which page to remove or the process might have said, you know what, I'm tired of you bothering me all the time. Here's a little function that you can run on the pages that I have resident in memory, and it will tell you which one to remove. Mul scheduling multiple threads within the process, another thing that I can either ask the process for help with or potentially use a little bit of code to do inside the operating system. So what's nice about this? I can always ask the application of the library operating system to do these things, and they have mechanisms for doing this. What's the nice thing about potentially loading the decision-making procedure into the operating, into the exo kernel and running it there. What's better about it? There's one very clear thing that's better about it, yeah. Yeah, it's faster, right? Remember the kernel crossing, I still have kernel crossings, I still have a kernel interface, it's different than the usual one, and I still don't want to have to cross it too many times. Um, and it also allows the, the exo kernel to predict how long certain things will take, how long it will take the app to make a decision about which page to remove a priori. And that allows me to predict whether or not it's buggy or not. What's the problem with this, though? There's this sort of 
huge glaring, it's like a big red light should be flashing in your brain right now, right? Yeah. No, that's not it. Yeah. Yeah, this is potentially super unsafe, you know? <laughs> like, I do not want the process to be able to run with kernel privilege, and now I'm asking it, hey, you got some code you want me to run? You know? I, I got kernel privilege over here, you got some random code you want me to just execute in the kernel? I have no idea what it does. Um, so actually there was a lot of research around this time on extensible OS designs, and a lot of them tackled precisely this problem, which is, how do I determine, given a arbitrary code snippet, that it will complete, that it will not break a bunch of stuff that I care about? Uh, and so there's a lot of related work. These guys don't really focus on it. It's not the main focus of the paper, but it is there. That's okay. That's, that's what I want. Because remember, I only apply this policy to the application's own resources. Does, does that make sense? This is exactly what I want to happen. I want, if I take a page from process A or a page from process B, I want to allow them to make the decision totally different. That's the whole design goal of the system in, in, in the first place, right? It's just a question of how it happens. Um, okay, so, so finally, before we quickly, you know, talk about the evaluation, I, I know I'm almost out of time, um, there's this final thing that happens when things go wrong. So for example, let's say that I've asked a process to remove a page of memory, and I sit there waiting, 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 and it, like, it, it's not, it hasn't told me which page is okay to remove. What do I do? So there's a protocol for dealing with this. They call it the abort protocol. Really, there's two things I can do. One thing is I can kill the process. That's not necessarily a terrible idea. Um, their solution is to forcibly remove the resource without the app's help and inform it via an interrupt or some other thing. So assuming that the app is running correctly and is just bad at doing a particular thing, I can take control back, make the decision. This, this gets a little messy. They say, oh, well, we're gonna copy out certain things to memory if they need to be deallocated and then it can find them later, but it's kind of, I don't know, this is not, not fantastic. So in the evaluation, they try to show four things. They try to show that exokernels can be efficient this is important because I'm potentially creating, remember the whole microkernel problem? I don't want to go down that road again. So I need to show that this works and that by putting policy into the library, I'm not slowing the whole system down to the point that I don't care about how it's designed anymore. It's just too darn slow. The second thing is they want to show that this works. So that, and, and this is really, these two things are the same. Exokernels rely on secure low-level resource multiplexing, so that has to work efficiently. They show that you can implement traditional OS abstractions. They do that by building a library operating system that provides those abstractions. And then finally, they try to show that applications benefit from this arrangement. Um, so I'll just skip over this. There are two parts to the system. Aegis is this exokernel, and then Exos is the library operating system. Together, they provide, I'm assuming, a Unix-like interface given the evaluation metrics they ran. Um, I won't read this, but their conclusion is yes, this works as far as the performance aspects. For the extensibility experiments, they did some interesting things. Um, so for example, they looked at an extensible page table structure. So they allowed two different library operating systems to implement two different page table structures. One that was designed for sparse address spaces that uses a tree. The other is designed for compact address spaces and it just uses a list. As, or an array or something like that. Because so, remember, if I don't have a sparse address space, I can use a much simpler data structure to represent the address space, to map virtual to physical addresses. And then the other thing they did is this extensible, extensible scheduling where what they do is they allocate time to a process, but then they allow the library operating system to divide up the time between multiple threads or sub-processes that are running underneath that process. Okay, so on Friday we will start talking about performance. We have two lectures on performance and I will see you on Friday.